the most important aspect of uh, either a nucleation or an evisceration is utmost sterility to prevent the implant becoming infected. Um, therefore a cataract style cleaning and draping uh, is the key starting point, making sure that the lashes are totally out of the operative field. The decision whether to do an enucleation or an evisceration is very much uh, up to the individual and up to the pathology. Uh, for this patient, the eye is blind, secondary to uh, a penetrating trauma with an intractable retinal detachment that's unfortunately become painful. Once a patient has both a blind and painful eye, they're normally very keen indeed to have an artificial eye. The first step is a subconjunctival local anaesthetic, and this can also be supplemented by a peribulbar uh, local anaesthetic. Uh, and if you don't put a peribulbar anaesthetic in at the beginning, be sure to put one in at the end. The next step is a conjunctival peritomy, exactly as you would do for either vitreo retinal surgery uh, in terms of hooking the muscles or indeed for squint surgery. So a relieving cut is made. Uh, I like to make my two relieving cuts, uh, one inferior to the lateral rectus and then one superior to the medial rectus and then make a pocket underneath the conjunctiva and tenons. Bring the edge of your spring scissors as close as you can to the limbus to preserve as much conjunctiva as possible. The pocket is quite easily found in this patient inferiorly, um, but is a little bit more difficult superiorly as that's the site of previous surgery. If a patient has had extensive previous attempts with uh, VR surgery to reattach a retina, then often the tissues can be very bound down and this dissection is significantly more difficult. Even it, for an evisceration, it's still worth freeing the conjunctiva and tenons and clearing the pocket between the muscles to make the end closure as, as effortless as possible. So you, you want to, at the end of this stage, you want to have the feeling that both your conjunctiva and subtenons layers are going to be quite mobile as you close the sclera. The next step is to excise the cornea and you need to make sure that you come right to the edge of any residual adherent conjunctiva. This can't be left behind. And I normally use a keratome to initiate the excision, penetrate the anterior chamber, um, but staying, obviously, as you would in cataract surgery, staying away from the uveal tissue at this stage. The left and right corneal scissors are absolutely ideal, and you simply, slowly and carefully nibble your way around. There's some adherent tissue here that I'm excising and then the cornea is removed. All the uveal tissue needs to be removed to both minimise inflammation and minimise the risk of sympathetic ophthalmitis, um, which is thankfully very rare. I try and hold the edge of the sclera and use my spring scissors to open up the plane uh, between the sclera and the uveal layer as this makes the uh, subsequent removal with the spoon a little easier. This is always a rather gruesome stage um, but the spoon needs to be swung right round and the full uveal tissue removed. 
Here it's mostly coming out effortlessly and then there's the area of the previous surgery where the uvea is adherent to the sclera. This is ultimately uh, needing to be snipped off again using the spring scissors. The uh, bleeding at this stage can uh, mostly be ignored as it very rapidly stops on its own. Uh, otherwise you can of course cauterize uh, and or pack. The scleral uh, coat needs to be able to move fully anteriorly to wrap uh, a good size implant and therefore I cut my scleral coat into two uh, uh, halves. Each half therefore can roll forwards uh, very easily and to do this you simply need to continue with your incision until each side uh, reaches the optic nerve at the back and then you pass the optic nerve, nerve either superiorly or inferiorly and make the two sides join making sure that you're tucking your spring scissors each time in the pocket between the tenons you don't want to be uh, cutting your conjunctiva at this stage and then finally one last little snip and the sclera is in two halves Cleaning and inspecting the sclera is very useful and you can remove any residual bits of uveal tissue. The sizes are fantastic in order for you to determine what size implants you can put in easily. They slide in effortlessly. You can tuck your edges around them and they also have the benefit of having a, a, a compressive weight which means that while they're in they also help stop any residual oozing. So this confirms that I can put a size 20 implant in and close it easily. This is a medpore implant and I'm therefore uh, ejecting any air, residual air bubbles in it and mixing it in a solution of saline with some gentamicin to further try and minimize the risk of any infection. The Medpore implant comes with an absolutely fantastic inserter but there is an argument that for an evisceration all you need is a spacer and you don't need an integrated implant and that the Medpore is therefore a little expensive. Um, however it certainly is a very nice implant to use and in a young patient there may well be an advantage for the longevity of an integrated implant. Tucking the inserter in position uh, you then push the ball right down to the bottom and hold it down while lifting the inserter uh, back out Obviously the spherical surface of the ball can make this a little tricky but the key thing is keep the ball down while the inserter lifts and then the sclera will be advanced around the ball and will close easily without any tension. You can either trim the edges or overlap the edges and here I'm, I'm tucking the superior sclera underneath the inferior sclera and then using a 5-0 vicral to close the sclera. This normally needs uh, about five sutures um, but essentially put in as many as you require to get a good safe closure. There should be no tension at all on the closure Where the sclera is overlapping, the bite uh, 
superiorly simply takes a bite of the upper portion of the sclera and then the inferior bite is the edge and this helps lift the sclera into its overlapped position. These sutures are going in upside down uh, in the hope that the knot will be nice and buried and cause less uh, irritation to the overlying uh, subtenons closure and the conjunctival closure above that. The next step is to close the subtenons layer. To find this layer simply hold the conj and pull and then take a, a deep bite and again a buried stitch uh, is the best technique. I've swapped to a 6-0 vicral and again you want to make sure that there's going to be no tension whatsoever on the conjunctival layer and put in enough sutures into the subtenons layer to cover the previous layer of sutures. Sometimes easing the tension on the lid caliper can make the closure a little easier. And the other option is at the beginning of the dissection you can place traction sutures on the conjunctiva which then as the tissues swell throughout the procedure can make the identification of the conjunctiva uh, more straightforward at the end. So the closure is effectively in three layers, a layer to the sclera, a layer to the subtenons, and then finally under no tension you come to close the conjunctiva and I'm using a 7.0 Vicryl for this layer and just run, run the suture from one side to the other. There should be, because there's no tension, uh, you really don't need a particularly strong suture and 7.0 or 8.0 Vicryl is ideal, although the size of the needle can make your suturing technique a little bit more laborious in that the normal technique to push the needle through and pick it up on the other side it gets harder and harder and you nearly always need to use the, the forceps uh, to help take the needle through. Then once this layer is closed put in your Marcane peribulbar injection if you didn't do so at the beginning and then finally insert a conformer and I like to put a good layer of chloramphenicol underneath the conformer and uh, these conformers have a handy little hole that you can squirt the chloramphenicol through. A pressure dressing is then placed.